Hello, geniuses. This is Christina Bruhan with Coin Genius here again for another Blockchain Versus episode. I am joined today by Daniel Goldman from Turnio. You guys recall we did an episode with him uh, around the Turnio Block Card, which is a Visa backed uh, digital and physical card so that you can spend your crypto getting uh, Starbucks and really fixes that point of sale situation. Today, we're going to be talking in uh, some specific categories around really being able to speak to people around the message of blockchain. So, uh, Daniel, I'm super excited to jump in here. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about what you're excited to talk about today? Yeah, no, um, you know, I, I, I run Turnio. I'm CEO, co founder of Turnio. Um, I'm in Atlanta. And, you know, it's basically, it's kind of, I think, the evolution of where things are going in terms of an interoperable uh, fintech platform that works with cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology, and also with traditional sort of 50-year-old fintech and banking systems. And we just kind of create this interoperability between what we think of as the way we interact with money today and what we think of the future of money is going to be. Um, and, and so we were, you know, we were having this conversation, uh, Christina, about sort of the political uh, dynamic and how maybe people view it on, you know, the Republican party versus the democratic party. And as a person who has a longstanding, you know, public track record and history in the democratic party, I've done a lot of things within, within the party, uh, many, 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 many things. Uh, so I have a, you know, one set, one worldview, right? I can, I see it from the worldview of how is this going to help people? If somebody has a liberal persuasion, if somebody's a Democrat, um, why is blockchain, why is cryptocurrency something that's good? You know, why is it going to be, do good in the world? So. I love it. So we're going to dive right into blockchain for liberals. That is the topic of this. And yes, we will present the balanced data for blockchain for conservatives. Uh, that will be headed up by, by a different pundit here. Um, so Daniel, my questions, my questions are always around the application of blockchain. We really believe at CoinGenius that mass adoption will occur when people don't even know that they're using blockchain, right? So right. let's talk a little bit around what you see in the landscape of blockchain right now. Um, we're also going to be touching on privacy and data management as a whole, like owning your own data. Um, there's obviously a huge impact on green technology. There's an impact to Wall Street and the liberal point of view of UBI and the conservative view of UBI. Right, and there's the corporate landscape, right? Fortune 500 has to evolve, and we really want to get our arms around what will the next generation believe to be normal, right? That's a lot to unpack here. So, where would you like to start? You throw anything at me, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> what What do you see the biggest benefit of blockchain for liberals as a whole? Like, what What do you think the biggest gold star for them is going to be? You know. Um... At the end of the day, it's a peer-to-peer -peer technology, so it's going to cut out a lot of unnecessary middlemen, um, and it's going to give people the ability, like right now, if somebody's dealing, there's a lot of people who are on the poor end of the spectrum, right? And they're paying um, a lot of money, a lot of fees to Western Union and, you know, check, check cashing and things like that, and it's, it's, um, it's expensive. Um, so blockchain... Let's, let's let me let me just interrupt. Maybe it's maybe it's best to kind of paint the paint the landscape of of the perspective that you represent the fo the things that you care about as a liberal as a democrat or that you feel the liberals care the most about. Let's just baseline for anyone like me that's a moderate, um, you know, to to understand really the heart and soul of of the impact, so that we can understand how blockchain. Uh, you know, removes the barriers that are currently there and could really help facilitate those things. Well, there's different people. There is not, you know, this is not like um, uh, Democrats are not monolithic. You know, we care about different things. Um, I'd say, let's say from the standpoint of the internet, um, supporting the growth of the internet and allowing it to kind of become uh, this, this thing that people didn't understand and allow it to basically uh, exist without a lot of regulations, some regulations, of course, that were passed, but limited, you know, fair rules, standards that allowed it to kind of cultivate and grow. And um, people are, you know, you think about tech companies, they're always viewed as being a very, like, liberal places. A lot of all the people who work with these, you know, tech companies are pretty, they're diverse. They represent America. They represent the, you know, the, the, the beauty and the 
the genius that is a, a country founded by immigrants. Um, and so you, on one hand, you've got like, you know, uh, forward thinking, you think about what the word progressive means, like, like a, almost like a Teddy Roosevelt, he was a progressive, he was a, he was a Republican, by the way. Um, but being progressive, meaning wanting to get change, wanting to go further, wanting not to just accept what we've always accepted as being historical past, but actually wanting to do more, the next thing. Um, and I think that blockchain is gonna allow for us to innovate and be entrepreneurial. That's one element of the Democratic Party. On the other hand, um, you've got things in terms of making sure that consumer protections, making sure people are not being uh, taken advantage of. And what's effectively happening, um, and I, I look at things from every which way, I'm a market-based person, um, and I think that blockchain gives people the ability to control their own destiny, to control their own money, which is gonna create uh, some challenges for banks. It's going to allow uh, more competition in the marketplace from a standpoint of banks. And that means that banks won't be able to rip you off with a $30 wire fee, and they're gonna have to be better, fee better cheaper, faster. They're gonna have to innovate and offer new services. They can't just rest on their laurels with their existing uh, business models that they have right now. The, we the, the check cashiers aren't gonna be able to rip people off. The Western unions of the world that are charging people absorbent fees, that's gonna be uh, under significant downward pressure because of what blockchain and cryptocurrency is gonna do. So you put all that together, that's a lot of different things, um, but, um, but all those things are gonna be things that people care about within the Democratic Party. Daniel, what can you tell me about blockchain and transparency? I, I understand that Democrats and liberals, they care a lot about some of these programs that keep communities together. They're not inclined to kind of just cut the money, but there's, a, there's an overarching need to know where the money is going. I think that yeah. that could be something that's really relevant as well. Well, you hear about it, you know, you hear about it in... The Republican Party, they always talk about, you know, the way you're going to cut government is you're going to cut it through uh, fraud, waste, and abuse, and you're just going to get rid of that, and that's going to solve all the deficit problems, which is a lie. It's a, it's a, it's a figment of your imagination. Um, but what I will say is that this is the, the conservative idea, right, of, in theory, I mean, what conservative used to be, by the way, not a so-called conservative today, right? Because Donald Trump is not a conservative. I hate to tell you, sorry. So if you're voting for Donald Trump, don't just do me a favor, just don't call yourself a conservative. You can vote for him all you want, just don't call yourself a conservative. Um, and so, you know, if in fact the idea is around transparency and, and, and trying to make sure that we're gutting fraud, waste, and abuse, right? This is an excellent application for it. It's not the thing you normally hear about from Democrats. Um, efficiency in government. <laughs> is not the thing you hear about. And, and, and one thing that I think Democrats can learn is that just throwing money at a problem doesn't solve the problem on its own. I mean, it's important to make sure you're funding things properly, but um, just throwing money you know, at it does not mean that it, it works. And so you have to have both a good funding mechanism, a good plan, a good execution, and transparency. And I think blockchain, in the proper utilization, the proper use case, uh, can allow for incredible transparency. And I'll, I'll just give it a non-Democrat, non-Republican example. Um, in Mexico, there's a lot of fraud, right? A lot of corruption. Well, if you have, if you're able to track home ownership in Mexico, and let's say you've got some police officers um, who happen to have some very wealthy homes that their title is listed on blockchain, and these police officers make not that much money, but they've got this beautiful casa and name your, you know, your secondary home and some vacation home in Puerto Vallarta or wherever, um, how the hell do they own, how the hell can they afford that? Well, the Mexican government could use the blockchain, uh, just, just literally tracking who owns what, to be able to identify that kind of corruption. There's a million use cases for blockchain, though. It's so synonymous with, I mean, there's so many things. It is. I like to remind the audience, for those of you that are hearing some of this for the first time, Blockchain creates the ability to, for the data to come to you in real time. You essentially say, I want to know the answer to this, and it goes out and scans the system. And because of how blockchain works, that system cannot be corrupted yet. You got to get quantum physics and things involved in there before we get there. It's really expensive to even think about that stuff yet. So for right now, there's layers and mathematicians that are kind of creating answers that come down to it, like someone asked me the other day, why does blockchain work? And I said, very similar to how gravity works. Gravity works because gravity, like blockchain works because it's blockchain. 
And it's as simple as because physics, because math, because science, because blockchain. Now there are layers to all of that, right? And so that's what we want to help folks understand is that when you understand those layers, it can be applied to everything from, um, you know, the, the actual abacus of counting things down to a very granular level and that bubbles up into real time information, all the way to protecting your privacy to uh, being able to have ownership of your data within a tokenized economy. Um, and there are significant advantages to what we call at Coin Genius the global economic engine, how Wall Street behaves and what that means on a 24 seven crypto landscape. Um, but that also changes massive dynamics right now around oil and gas, green energy, AI and blockchain. There's so many applications of this. Agriculture will change. All of these things will change. And I think that if, if there's a way for it to be communicated into the, the possibilities of the progress, I feel like Daniel has a lot to share about that. Well, and I'll say one thing. Uh, um, it's important to understand. What I love about blockchain is it's, it's politically agnostic. We all have personal political beliefs. We all have personal um, uh, beliefs around religion, you know, like everyone's entitled to their own opinion and that's all fine, uh, at least in this country, we're supposed to. Um, but when you meet, it, it, blockchain is just kind of, a, it's, a, it's in a good place politically from the standpoint of that it's not a liberal, it's not, it's not a liberal thing. It's not a conservative thing. It is, you're as likely to meet as many conservatives who don't know what the hell they're talking about when it comes to blockchain as you are to meet as many liberals who don't know what the hell they're talking about when it comes to blockchain. And I will listen, and, and conversely, some really awesome uh, Republicans who I hear talking about, I, I, I see their commitment to blockchain and cryptocurrencies, and I, I, I pay attention to all the, the congressional hearings around anything with crypto. And I don't, I mean, there's a kind of a conserv, there's like a dual working group between like eight or 10 Democrats and Republicans, right? And they get it, they understand it, they think it's gonna be forward thinking, it's not political from the standpoint of, like I said, it doesn't, there's no lobbying group that's like, you know, in one particular corner. And I hope it stays that way because it's something that's going to benefit the country. And in the way that the internet, I hope, was not viewed as being this liberal initiative, um, I think of blockchain as being this thing that's for all the people. And, um, and I hope that, the, and that's why we have this conversation, that the, there's a lot of misunderstanding on the liberal side, right? I've, have, I've had crazy conversations uh, about, people thinking Bitcoin's a Ponzi scheme. And, you know, it's like, I'm like, listen, like, you don't know what you're talking about, right? And this is to my, to my people, <laughs> you know, so. Uh, if, if you had, yeah, like, if you had those talking points, what, what did, what would you wish people had as their little short list of, of talking points, right? The actual data, that's what Coin Genius is trying to bring with the education, right? Is what's the real data behind it, right? What are the things that you wish they could, amplify right the things you know are the real talking points not 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 that not the more propaganda and the scams and the wish wash you know blow it off but the real data points behind it so that folks can speak articulate to look at, articulately obviously i can't <laughs> another drink uh so <laughs> um, water. you know i say um being in it for two and a half years is running the comp you know, company that I, I have, it, you get into this point where you kind of only associate in your every day is with people who understand it already. So I, I forget how normal people think about it, right? Um, the every average day person. And, I, and, I, and I'll, I'll give an example of why, once again, there's really not a differentiation between conservatives and liberals. I, on one hand, I had a conversation with a very conservative guy who's in Alabama, uh, entrepreneur, great person, and we're taught, he's saying, you know, the thing about what you guys do is great, but uh, you just need to find a way to get rid of the, uh, you know, the taint associated with it. And uh, I'm like, what do you mean? You know, like he basically views Bitcoin as a, effectively as being the dark web. He's thinking of Bitcoin as like 2010. You use Bitcoin to buy drugs and maybe, a, you know, pay a hitman, you know, <laughs> whatever. And so like, that's what he's thinking. Uh, and he's a conservative, right? And so then on the other hand, like I'm literally seeing like visceral reactions from people like a uh, good example, there's a congressman out of California who I just want to throw like rocks and stones at, at the TV every time he talks about uh, cryptocurrency because all he thinks about with blockchain is Bitcoin. And when you listen to this guy, um, he, he literally talks about how it's Brad Sherman, Brad Sherman out of California. And he says, 
you know, like it's only being used for, it's, it's being used for terrorism, it's being used to launder money. And if you hear guys like Donald Trump talk about Bitcoin, he's an, he's an like imbecile on this topic, okay? Um, no matter where you stand, like this guy is like, if you're a crypto person, Donald Trump is not your guy. He's anti-Bitcoin, okay. Um, I think the biggest misunderstanding is that that people associate Bitcoin as being the thing that is blockchain and they don't understand that Bitcoin is an app that sits on top of a blockchain technology. It's, yeah, and blockchain is, it, it's independent of Bitcoin. Bitcoin made blockchain the, the technology famous um, and it is its application like we've seen with Jamie Dimon, a Democrat um, who was, ant, you know, like publicly, you know, antagonistic towards Bitcoin and what do they do? They're rolling with their own, yeah, they're exactly. And now you can make the argument um, well, you know, you know, it's, he, he said, it's, well, it's, I don't care what it is. It's better, cheaper, faster. And that was like, well, that's the whole point. This is the point. This is the future. And if JP Morgan accepts that re as reality, I think and the Paul future is Jones. Future. Yeah. Hey, let's, let's not forget the folks that are jumping on the bandwagon here. It's, it's very much a legitimate market because it's a legitimate market. There is, you know, 200 to 300 billion, billion dollars in there. Um, it's, and it's about, that's a about tiny, about teeny, teeny, tiny, it's a teeny, tiny piece of, of like the overall global economic engine. But we just printed $7 trillion. That's like way bigger than the entire crypto market. And like, they're like, it's fine. It'll totally be fine. Don't worry about it. I'm like, oh my God. Well, I mean, Bitcoin was made for this moment. That, check out our Genius Wednesday. <laughs> Bitcoin was made for this moment. Daniel, please continue. It's a it's a digital it's a digital commodity, and so the main thing I, it's funny that's why I say I keep going back to like I I can tell you like how I try to explain it to people in the Democratic Party. Uh, oh, I'll say you hear Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren is a liberal. Okay, there are few people more liberal than Elizabeth Warren, former Republican, uh, from born in Oklahoma, and she she has a public press release talking about the benefits of blockchain technology and how it's going to be, you know, very forward thinking. Now, she didn't speak about Bitcoin. She was talking about blockchain technology because she's a well-educated, um, well-informed woman who is very powerful in the Senate. And, I, and I'd love to see more and more people of whatever political persuasion to just continue to educate themselves on the use cases, the technology, understanding the difference between where they connect and where they disconnect, and, and, and not to take a position like India, which the government in India took the wrong position because what you would regularly hear in India was more of like, a, well, you know, we, um, we support blockchain technology. We just don't support cryptocurrency. It's like, well, then you don't know what you're talking about because cryptocurrency is many, many things. It could be a digital, um, you know, dollar. It could be the digital, uh, what, what are they using in, uh, what's the local currency in India all of a sudden I'm forgetting? The, I forget. The rupee, I know, rupee. I know China's yuan. Yeah, the I rupee, the rupee. But the, the point pound, is, like, you can't, <laughs> you can't be for blockchain without understanding that the transformational element is the, is the fact that the, the blockchain, which is like the data layer and the, and the app that sits on top of it, which is like the, tr the value layer, the transfer layer, the, uh, the, the, the payment layer, those two things are interconnected in a way that is going to, that's the transformational part. And you cannot take away one from the other. I mean, you can, you can have blockchain without the payment layer, but you're taking away all the, all the transformational value. Um, not all of it, but a lot of it. So, so if, if we have start to see an evolution in the U.S. where it's more like that, to me, I think that's very naive um, a perspective in, in India. Uh, and thank God that the Supreme Court ruled against it in India. But if we were to do that in the U.S., I would consider that a huge step backwards. It really needs, we need to have a thoughtful discussion among conservatives, so-called conservatives among uh, liberals and Democrats and independents and really making sure that this is really not a partisan issue. Awesome. Um, I, I really want to pick on the corporate landscape from a liberal standpoint. Um, what could blockchain do for corporate and helping folks like become more efficient and, you know, increase bottom line? What's important to liberals from that standpoint? you see a lot of animosity around corporations because what happens is not because people hate corporations per se, although I think some people are kind of, they, they maybe they haven't fully thought it out. So they just kind of 
have them. They just don't like them. But I think that the problem is what you're seeing is this Amazon, right? Amazing company. Hired a lot of people, grown incredibly and scary as hell as a, as a very, like Jeff Bezos is more valuable than Bitcoin, okay? <laughs> on paper anyway, on paper today. Um, but Amazon doesn't have to pay any taxes. GE doesn't pay any taxes. Um, yeah, there's something to corporate handout. Like there's something to corporate welfare about our structure that needs to be seriously rethought. Yeah. I would argue as well that the liberals and the and the Democrats really need to have a much better plan to present to say this is our plan, not we don't like their plan, but just go this is our plan. And I was speaking with a colleague of mine the other day that right now a lot of us are in the position of ain't nobody got time for that. We don't have time for them to be fighting on the floor. We don't have time for stalemates. We don't have time for all. the world is spinning forward and we have to innovate along with it. I think that there's a lot to be said around carbon credit and being able to tax some of this corporate handout by leveraging blockchain and some of the initiatives that are around programs that want to move these things forward. If you need a level of trust at any point between hand, handshakes between systems, blockchain is the way to do it. What can you tell me around some of, the, some of those initiatives? Well, I, I, I just get, you know, the idea that Democrats don't have a plan, I don't think is, I think it's false, uh, 100%. Um, you know, like, for example, it's not just being against things, it's about not stepping backwards. The, the idea that somehow corporations pay these crazy tax rates is bullshit. Um, some industries do. Uh, I will say, oil companies pay a lot in tax rates, actually. They pay a lot. And, and I don't think liberals appreciate that. They don't know that. It's true. They pay a lot in taxes. And then you have a lot of tech companies like an Amazon, and they pay nothing, or a GE. There's like 40 companies, big companies, zero. So there's a lot of stuff out there, and I can tell you what it shouldn't be, is cutting the corporate tax rate from what it was and giving a $1.7 trillion handout to corporations that all they did was then give it to their, you know, basically buy back stock, and then they didn't have any money, like Boeing. Okay, that's offensive, because what you're really doing is you're really, it's, it's funding the sort of corporate, you're funding corporate welfare in many ways. Walmart. Walmart's not paying people. They're doing better, but they're not paying people great wages. And you Walmart got people- gets food stamps. Like, oh, don't get me started. Like they get, okay. and then they get tax right on so those are the That's issues. a whole other conversation. Those are the issues. Okay, though, we got to keep going. <laughs> those are the issues Democrats care about. Um, now, in terms of how can the technology be used to track things like carbon credits, which Republicans aren't for, okay? You can talk about carbon credits all you want. Republicans are not for it. They're against it. They've been against it even when they co-sponsored legislation for it. So, you know, there's just, um, it's going to take, uh, I, don't, I don't know, the, that, the blockchain's not going to solve any of the political back and forth, but if, if government will, when, they, when, they're, when they're paying for, government is forward thinking, some people in government are forward thinking. I mean, I talk to people in government and they are like using blockchain applications in military, they're using blockchain applications at the HHS, uh, they're using different forms. I think there needs to be a comfort level that blockchain can solve a problem. And what ends up happening is they end up hiring an IBM, not always, but, or they'll hire a Deloitte or, you know, some of these larger, larger companies because those are the ones they it's trust. too big. Yeah. Yeah. They, but, but like, I mean, like, I can't well, give you the exact use case for carbon credits, but what we know is that it's, it's, it's a real-time settlement, a real-time data sharing among multiple parties. It can track anything. It can do, it can track payments of taxes automatically. With the government needs a good use case to demonstrate before it ever gets to like, you're going to need to see it in private life. I, I, I mean, I, and I actually believe this. I think this is good. Let's demonstrate it as a use case in private life so there's a comfort level because government's massive. It's big. Right. I mean, it's the biggest thing we've got. It's trillions of dollars a year in budget. And then like take that use case and say, okay, well, we can apply this and we can apply it here. Um, beyond just a proof of concept, beyond some sort of innovative thing that we're trying to do. Yep. So we see that a lot in the Genius Network, and that's something that we help foster is those companies that are have a really good use case um, because it does have to have a very strong ecosystem and it has to be able to have those handoffs. There's technology behind it that's hard to do. That's why sometimes acquiring a startup is easier than you trying to build it yourself. So for those of you that have big budgets that are trying to pivot, think about some of those things and Genius Network can, can help you with all of that. Oh, and when you get into Daniel, government, I will say, I'll just say when you get into government, like forget liberal 
conservative, it's there's a lot of greed that's just like, I want the contract. So there, it, there really is a, a pretty nonpartisan, for the most part, a pretty nonpartisan approach towards gaining government contracts. Like the, a lot of these people are former military, former government people. They understand the machinations of the, you know, of how systems work and they don't care about your politics. They just want to, you know, they, they see a, a million, $2 million contract from the government and they see green <laughs> and that's what they go for. And I'll just say, cause I, I've talked to a lot of folks and, and maybe they're, maybe they're a Democrat, maybe they're a Republican, but it's not like they're not interjecting their politics into the government thing. They're just trying to be as nonpartisan yeah. as possible. And a lot of the times, a lot of times we, we do, like, you just end up going towards the middle just to, uh, just to deal with, you know, all of the factors. Um, a lot of times you have to take politics out of business. A lot of times your politics is your business. <laughs> There's a lot of factors there. Talk to me a little bit around, you said Democrats have a plan. We probably should have started with this. What okay. is the Democrat plan? What is the platform? And, um, and then we'll get in, if you can lay that out as the baseline, then we'll get into the blockchain components and some of the extra layers. Depends on what the issue is. No, I, I will say that what I was referring to specifically was your, your part about the taxation part. Democrats do have a plan. And I think it varies wildly from whoever you pick. But if you look at the House, they pass that's legislation. That's kind of the problem. Yeah, we need well, something a little more. We need something a little more baseline, in my opinion. And that's the case from Republicans too. Republicans from true still conservatives still called moderate. So what ends up happening is what will they sign on for? The House has passed legislation uh, for taxes. It's it's alternative minimum tax. It's the so-called you know the estate tax that used to exist and has now been removed to only help the wealthy. Only help the wealthy. There was a ten million exemption there. So if you owned a family farm. Like you were fine. There was not going to be a worry that you're going to have to lose the family farm. It's ten million dollar exemption, and even after that, there are trusts. There's all kinds of different ways people uh, get around their taxation. So, you know, I'd say what it was is, it, it's about building. It's kind of like saying, okay, we're going to spend two trillion dollars this year, whatever your budget is. How are we going to pay for that? And up until this point, I'll say, I'll, I'll give you a little factoid. People love Ronald Reagan. He increased the deficit by five hundred and fifty percent. It was a trillion dollars when he took over. Not good. It was 5.5 trillion when he left. Somehow he's the rig, he's the Republican God. Well, I don't know how the hell that is if you really care about the deficit. Don't tell me you care about the deficit. Under Bush, under Reagan, certainly not under Trump. And you have to go back as far as Dwight D. Eisenhower in order to find a Republican that's done anything about the deficit. So that's 50s. So well, um, I'm I'm not sure that this will be a very popular opinion, but I feel like the current economic engine that we live in, we are borrowing against our kids' livelihoods. We're borrowing against their ability to work. We, I don't know that Social Security is going to be there when I get will. to that age. It will be. There is, there's a lot of factors, uh, especially around, you know, the wealth gaps, your ability to accumulate wealth if you're not born into a certain, it is really hard to climb the ladder. And I think that there is a lot of, there's a lot of opportunities for blockchain and uh, global education uh, that, that might be able to, to be a factor there as well. Well, let me give you one example. We talk about the wealth gap, right? That's something I think liberals care a lot about. The pro um, so I'll, I'll give you one example. So recently when you had this whole, you know, totally uh, foreseeable that could have been prevented in a way that did not demolish our economy. And now we're in this position where we've got just crazy unemployment. We've got, we spent $7 trillion in order to stop the bleeding, the hemorrhaging but it could have been all avoided, okay, um, had we had some actual leadership. Um, and there was a bill that was passed in the House that was by the Democrats, one under the committee with Maxine Waters out of uh, Harlem, you know, she's liberal as they get, um, and Nancy Pelosi, who is, of course, the, the Speaker of the House. And what was cool was that they, it wasn't quite blockchain, but it was a step in the right direction, and that was about paying people digitally directly to a card, right, or paying them, getting directly to paying people, trying to cut out unnecessary intermediaries. Now, it ended up not being accepted by the, by the Senate. And you would think that this is the kind of stuff that the, you know, that Republicans would embrace, but they don't um, because like any, you, you see it across, across both parties, some, uh, they're, they're, they're beholden to certain constituencies. So the middle, well, the banks kind of own everybody, right? They own them yeah. all. Like it, the people it, it, that got them there, yeah, they're beholden to the people that got them there, and the people that got them there got to where they're at because of the status quo. They don't like this change that we're talking about. It disrupts almost every single one of them. And there are certain and industries that are like that. 
peer-to-peer -peer currencies make it so you don't even need a bank in the middle and that disrupts that's the right. hell out of everything. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, so where I envi envi envision is, you know, cause you say, okay, well, what have they done? Well, their proposal was digital money effectively, not quite blockchain money, but it was digital money. It was a step in the right direction. And we know the federal reserve is looking at blockchain based money, kind of like what China's doing. But if you can start to do, whether it's blockchain or, or something like push payments, like what Visa does, but basically say, okay, we've got one, one account from the, that, that's controlled by the government, not hiring this expensive intermediary, getting where they make all this money and sending money to somebody's uh, visa card directly or issuing them a card and sending them the mail with money on it. Like cutting out as many intermediaries as possible is going to be cheaper for the government. It's going to be faster. And I, I will say that the biggest problem with this whole circumstance was you hear about it, helicopter money. Helicopter money is a conservative philosophy for Milton Friedman. It, it's literally like, don't worry about spending a lot of money trying to manage and administrate over, you know, getting it in the ecosystem. Just go and deliver it to a bunch of people who need it. Not to wealthy people, not trickle down people, but literally like, just give the money out because it's going to be more efficient to just drop the money out to anybody, just anybody, because otherwise you're going to experience deflation. And that's a, that's a conservative philosophy. He's like the freaking godfather of conservative philosophy when it comes to economics. And, and, and you mentioned two there. You mentioned uh, you mentioned uh, the the uh, helicopter money, and you mentioned trickle down theory, which are both like antithesis of, of liberal ideas. Um, I've heard the well, UBI helicopter money is not a liberal. Idea. It is it is supported. But it's right. Not a like, what, so what's the what's the counter argument on the liberal side then? No, if we were in debate. Number one, liberals support the idea of helicopter money, but the point is that's a conservative philosophy that liberals don't have a problem with. The trickle down, here's the problem. When we had this situation with Corona, we were not built to, it's a big government. We're not built to react quickly to the, to the crisis that existed. So when people said, well, we're going to get people money in people's hands in two, three, you know, a week, like you're out of your mind. They don't have the infrastructure. They don't have, they're not built, designed to be able to deliver that. And if you had money, whether on blockchain or whether it just be some other, I personally prefer blockchain money, you know, digital cash, then you now can basically, today, Turnio could have done that like instantly, right? We could have literally said, okay, give me a contract and we will literally deliver money to every single person in America for you. We could have done that. Like it's a private solution. Government should be adopting infrastructure that allows for that peer-to-peer -peer mechanism, whether it be unemployment, whether it be um, WIC and food stamps, whether it be, you know, um, paying people out these one-time fees because, you know, the economy's in the, in, in the hole, whatever it is, try to eliminate and make it as quick as possible. You don't need to mail money. They, they wanted to mail money for two reasons. Number one, because they had no choice. They, there are many ways they didn't have a, a choice because they didn't have the infrastructure. Number two, because Donald Trump wanted his name on the check. So, sorry, conservatives, so-called conservatives. All right, we'll keep going. I want to keep this avalanche going. I want you to go as fast as you can with everything that you would like to say to the liberal audiences we're coming into an election year. In terms of blockchain, if we're going to advocate for change in blockchain, what does that mean to you? Man, you know, Bitcoin is a phenomenal thing because, um, you know, it's not... It's built on top of blockchain technology, but it's a use case that people can touch. It's going to be something that is um, a smart investment that people don't understand. For the liberals I've talked to who call it um, a Ponzi scheme or it's used for money laundering, like, you know, look, you need to do some research. There is a lot of amazing technology here. I, I, like, I was talking to somebody yesterday and they were like saying, hey, like, um, you know, if there are people who use cars to murder people, they run over people, that doesn't mean that cars are inherently, you know, should be banned. Um, and I think that that's true. So can Bitcoin be used for nefarious things? Yes, it can be. But oh, by the way, it can also be tracked in real time on a real time ledger. It's public. You can identify whether or not it's been obfuscated. It is going to, it is the evolution of where money is going. And oh, by the way, no matter how strong government is, NSA, uh, military, nothing can shut down Bitcoin. You'd have to shut down the internet. And even then, I'm pretty sure it would still run on some kind of SMS platform. So um, to, to my liberal friends, it's something you should embrace. It's something that you will hopefully understand that it will become, at the end of the day, whether it's Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency, people will be able to control their own money and custody their own money in a, without needing a bank. 
the, the ideas around the underbanked and the unbanked, they talk about, we will exist in a world where banks will still exist, but they'll be far less relevant. They will need to compete for people's business and, and people to manage their own money will have their own wallet. They won't need a bank because they will be their own bank. And I think that that is ultimately the future. They will have the option of being their own bank or using a bank. They'll have both options and both options are good. As long as they have the options, the market will decide. And uh, I think that's a good thing. I love it. For our Coin Genius audience, can you explain the difference between a liberal and a libertarian when it comes to blockchain? Well, they mean different things to different people. That's the problem with brands, you know, or names. It's like, you know, you say, well, I'm a conservative. Well, what does that mean? Well, it used to mean I cared about deficits. I used to mean I cared about the military. It used to mean a lot of things that doesn't mean today. Um, so, you know, what is a liberal today? You know, it's, it's, it's an ever-ranging thing. Is it a Bernie Sanders liberal, which is frankly, you know, more on the socialist <laughs> side of things? Or are you an Obama liberal? You know, they call Obama a socialist. He's a market guy, to be honest. So um, I'm an Obama liberal. That's me, uh, like so many uh, people in this world. Uh, and Biden's probably going to be the most liberal president we've ever had, even though he's so-called now he looks like a moderate. Uh, I think if you look at, you say, okay, liberal progressive, you say, okay, what does that mean? It means you support things like Medicare popular among conservatives that are old. Uh, it should support things like Medicaid because it helps the, el the elderly, people are disabled, it helps people who are pregnant. It means you believe in a social safety net. It means that you believe that trickle down is a, like, a disaster of an economic policy, which it is. The only way to really do it is to invest directly into like people with jobs at, at the bottom and then let that trickle up. That is a much more successful, we've seen it time and time again. Um, it doesn't mean being liberal is perfect. It leads to a lot of things that are not, just like being conservative leads to a lot of things that you, you wish wouldn't happen. But um, I'd say being a liberal means you care about equality in the world. You care about uh, you, you know, trying to treat others with respect and, and to do right by others. Caring about other people. Now, that's my take on it, but I think you could take a lot of that and you could say a lot of, a lot of that about a, a conservative, but when you get into the nitty gritty of what they support in terms of legislation, somehow, even though we're all great people, we have this sort of different worldview as to what gets us there. And, and I think that's where the divide comes in. I love it. I, um, I, I asked really for myself because my understanding of like liberals is one thing I know is very different than libertarians. Libertarians want to, so if, if liberals are like the government should help, the little guy, the little guy should be okay because life happens, some of us fall down and we need to be able to get back up. Uh, accidents happen, uh, we should probably support our veterans, things like that. Like that, that's, that's kind of the holistic liberal is like, we are all one, we need to take care of each other. Conservative tends to be like, uh, uh, you know, the, the competition of capital markets, the one person that, you know, you're kind of on your own and you make it your, yourself. Like those are very different. The libertarian is like, let's tear down all the walls. I don't want anyone telling me what to do. I want to do it myself and I can now through technology. That's the angle that I hear with libertarians. Well, that's um, so the, I just wanted our audience to understand those are two very different things. The libertarian, that's the thing is once again, labels is dangerous, right? Um, libertarians can be many different things. I will say traditionally libertarians um, are socially liberal. They're like, you don't want to smoke weed? Great. You know. To, to each and to his own, go and smoke weed, whatever. Um, you know, if you wanna go uh, whatever, you know, you know, just go do that. Like, it, it's more of like, do your own thing. But from a standpoint of supposedly like economic policy, it's like low taxation, you know, government spending should be lower. Um, at least in theory, that's what libertarians have traditionally stood for. And at least a libertarian typically kind of stands by their own convictions. They don't, they're not necessarily driven by, you know, God, guns, all that stuff that social conservatives are. Um, but, but I will say that it, depending upon the spectrum, just like on the liberal side, like on the conservative side, you know, there's any number of libertarians would say, yeah, of course I believe in public schools. Like what fucking idiot doesn't believe in public schools has benefited us for, you know, however long we've been doing it, a century. There are libertarians who don't think we should have public schools, right? Shouldn't, because government shouldn't fund anything. Well, so then the question mark is, well, should we not have the military? Should it be a no standing army? Should we not have publicly funded roads? Should they be all private? So we have to pay, you know, the private owner of that, of that bridge of that, you know, that road. Uh, most libertarians, I don't think believe that, but at its craziest form and its most extreme form, you, you know, libertarianism, which most people don't believe, I don't think, 
um, could basically be the government should fund nothing. That is a great way to sum it up. And great, if you like, awesome. by the way, if you really love libertarianism, go to Somalia, my favorite joke. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit around privacy and data with the blockchain. You work in the payments industry, probably the highest PII compliance and like SOC compliance level that it needs to have. Uh, we speak with folks like Brittany Kaiser that talks about on your data. We talk with folks that are building tokenized economies and being able to um, basically take the same level that Fortune 500 tracks your data to be able to sell more burgers or increase conversions. If you use that data to reward, you know, users for the behavior that they're already doing, they can earn things for watching videos. They can earn things for completing uh, educational courses or, or things of that nature. Um, and blockchain is like having teeny tiny granularity for all of those. Um, what can you tell me around privacy and data from your experience in the blockchain sector? Well, we are having to be PCI compliant. And when you're dealing with people's information, it's a big deal. And so security is paramount. Um, I mean, I think blockchain is just one way to do it. I think it's a more efficient way to do it because whether you're doing the use case you talk about where you're providing value to somebody, uh, let's say it's the effective difference of whether or not, let's say Delta wants to offer Delta points to consumers, but you know, it's in the Delta, in the Delta app versus it being like a cryptocurrency that you can trade on a marketplace or that's instantly convertible into some other place where you can custody yourself and no one can take it from you. But Delta points, they are the one that dictate whether or not you have access to those Delta points. Your, your value is strictly based upon or Amex points or whatever, right? Um, anyone could offer you a reward for reading and then it's stuck inside that app. Whereas with the cryptocurrency, it's like it's, it's something that's external that you can control, you can custody, you can own. Um, the economics behind those cryptocurrencies are yet to be determined. I think Brave is an amazing, amazing use case. Very few are doing this right, um, but I think that Brave is like the place, um, you know, led by an innovation and like a uh, entrepreneurial and, you know, uh, just amazing founder, Brendan, uh, Brendan and, um, and they're doing it right. But we'll see more and more of that. And, but the only effective difference is one is like you can custody it yourself and own it and trade it and it's instantly frictionlessly convertible. And the other one is you just go to AA.com for your American Airlines points and you, you can buy a gift card on the AA.com website. It's kind of the same thing, but, but in texture, it's, it's different because you have more control with the blockchain version versus the non-blockchain version. Awesome. And then another big question to unpack. If you had your way and we fast forwarded 10 years, what would the next generation, the, the ones that are like knee high right now, what is normal to them in 10 years that doesn't even exist right now? I think sending money peer to peer is going to be the thing 10 years from now. It'll be different. It's like today, the youngins, the youngins, you know, uh, cause I'm a Gen Xer. So I'm getting older. My back hurts. You know, like I'm 42. Don't judge me. Don't call me boomer either. Cause that's insulting. Um, the, I think today they use things like cash app and they use Venmo and it's like, it's like, okay, I, I'm going to send you money. But really what happens in the back is that if I send you money on Venmo, I didn't actually, it didn't go anywhere. Venmo had the money the whole time. All that Venmo said is Daniel doesn't have the money anymore. Now Christina has the money, but it never moved. It never physically moved. Venmo's in control of the money the whole time. But at least Christina knows like, okay, Daniel just shot me over the 10 bucks or whatever. And it's, it's all kind of that way. And it works. And I can pull it out and send it to my bank if I want to. I think that the future is going to be much, much more seamless than that. Uh, I think it's going to be more like, okay, okay, well, hey, I'm going to send you 15 bucks in two seconds, depending on your blockchain. But I think the future will be proof of stake. You know, Bitcoin is like a... a who knows what the hell that'll be worth at that point. It'll be amazing. But that's more like a savings account. I don't think it'll be used for payments. Bitcoin is not well suited for payments. It'll be very expensive. The, the mining fees alone in the future are probably going to be, you know, they're not cheap, right? So you'll have some kind of, you know, private, private permission system probably because governments will probably want to use a private permission system or some kind of public blockchain like a, like a Stellar or a Ripple. And they'll be able to send money quickly between each other. Um, whether it be a digital dollar or whatever the hell it is, even a digital dollar on the Stellar network, 
and then you'll get it and then you'll have that value you cut you custody it yourself you're your own bank and then i'm going to spend it on my mastercard or my visa because i don't think those are going to go away at all that's what i think the future is but it'll just be like digital money they won't know any difference i don't think it'll be the fluctuating some of it but most of it will just be yeah, i'm going to send you 10 bucks now it's 10 bucks and then and oh by the way i'm going to send money to my mom in mexico or india or wherever and it's just going to be like no big deal whereas today if i want to and i've talked to people who are like indian like you know, descendants, and maybe they were born here, but they have family in India, and they're helping people in India because it's, frankly, it's, you know, tough times in India. It's, you don't, the average wage is not very good. So sending $100 to India is a big, pretty meaningful thing. So I know people who are like, you know, telling me like, I got to go to Western Union to send the money to India. And then, you know, and I got to pay their fee and it's in, you know, inconvenient. I got to wait in line. I think all of that's going to go away. I'm going to do it for my app. I'm going to shoot it over to them. I won't need a bank. And it'll just be between me and my, my family member or friend done. I think that's the future. 10, 10 years from now. I love it. Um, I, I see all of that plus more. I think everything is going to move towards digital marketplaces and that everything is going to be like your money, like what you own and where it is, where it's located. Even uh, things like I have an extra room and then that could be on the blockchain and rental data and geolocation data. Our data, how we manage our data should be something you know that we are cognizant of and that can be monetized on. I think that, um, you know, I see a world where there's a lot more sharing. I see a world where there's a lot of things that are more equitable. I see a world where folks that we consider disadvantaged will be leapfrogging us in leaps and bounds in technology by adopting things that take a, a while for like institutional change to happen. Um, I'm very excited to be kind of in the on the front lines here, seeing this Darwinian evolution of the world. You know, we know that Pandora's box is open. We know that these digital currencies are out there. We know that there's a lot of applications of them. Uh, we didn't even talk about NFTs, which is a whole other avenue of things. Uh, but Daniel, in terms of kind of some final last thoughts here on blockchain for liberals, what would you what would you say is the most important thing that our audience takes away from today? Educate yourself, you know, do your own research and know that it's going to be, you know, it's like kind of like the, the, just like the internet did had so much transformation to the world. I mean, if you think about what the internet did for the world and how things have changed so much and it's 2020, most, you know, kind of AOL started kicking off really big in about 1995. It's about 25 years of, of effectively and before that, of course, but 25 years of basically of like sort of that, swell of mass adoption. And I think um, you'll do yourself a favor by educating yourself and understanding that the, the use of blockchain will be all encompassing. You notice that I've talked about a lot of payments type solutions because I'm focused on payments, but you've talked about so many of the things that are related to data sharing, real-time sharing, and all of these other things that are so many, it's like the underlying architecture behind everything we do. Um, and it, if a person takes the a time to, to understand that Bitcoin is one use case, but not the only use case, um, and that it's, you've got to, it, to understand the value that comes from Bitcoin and why it's so powerful. And then yet, you know, blockchain related solutions that could be for identity management or, you know, all, some of the things that Christina said, my takeaway is just take a moment to really learn about it and understand that it is going to transform the world. And if it done well, it'll probably do it in a way where you don't even realize you're interacting with something that's blockchain related, which is, I think, ultimately where it, why it's hard for people to grasp, because it's going to be that underlying thing that people just they're doing their thing and they don't even know it. They have no idea that it's on the blockchain. They did, conceptually, they just know that it works. Yep, I agree. I use the analogy that with some of the applications that I see in my day to day, you don't have to be a mechanic to get in your car and drive to the that's, store. And that's how it should work. That's what it is. That's really what it is. It's like, I don't know how I couldn't, I'm not a, a you know, a, a guy that can get in, let me go and get in there and fix that carburetor. You know, and, and I think the average person is going to be like, I'm going to get in the car and I'm going to drive it. But that's a great analogy. <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you for the support. Thank you for the support in the Genius Network. Thank you for taking the time to explain blockchain for liberals. Uh, for the, those in the audience that want to get a hold of you and follow up further, how do they reach you? I mean, I'm on LinkedIn all the time. Daniel Goldman uh, on LinkedIn, but um, I don't really use Twitter that much. And I hope you go to getblocker.com because while Daniel Goldman, the individual, has you know my own political persuasions, I assure you that.
that we still take Republicans and, uh, and independents and everybody else in this world uh, as customers. I mean, the cool thing about blockchain is that it's not a, it's not a political thing, and we hope to make that continue to be the case. Um, GetBlockCard.com is, is where you go, and um, we hope you love it. Awesome. Well, us at CoinGenius, we are big fans of Turnio and the block card, uh, the KYC AML uh, compliance of the on-ramp, off-ramp that comes with the Visa logo is a very big deal for those of us uh, that understand how the global payment structure works. So thank you for your good work there, moving the industry forward. And thank you for sharing your thoughts today. That was fun. Awesome. All right, Daniel, until next time, we'll see you at one of our upcoming events. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye, geniuses. We'll talk to you soon.